Welcome back. This is the last video in section one. 1. 1.7 is about inverse trigonometric functions. You want to be familiar with three different inverse trig functions. In this video, we'll go over precise arguments for inverse sine. We'll make comments about inverse cosine and inverse tangent. In the assignments, you're going to want to verify and apply the arguments we give for inverse sine to establish the formulas that we find for inverse cosine and inverse tangent. To get started, let's go back and recall the actual function inverse sine. Here's the graph of inverse sine. From the graph, we can see that the domain of inverse sine is negative 1 to 1. And the range of this increasing function is from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. The graph is clearly passing the vertical line test, meaning that the graph is the graph of a function. Equally, as an inverse function, this graph is passing the horizontal line test, meaning that it's a one-to-one -one function, such that if we invert this graph in the line y equal x, we produce the graph of another function. And this red curve is a portion of the sine wave. Hence, the green graph and the red graph are inverses to each other. But since the red graph is a portion of the sine wave, the green graph is the inverse of sine. Very good. So for this graph, we write down that y is inverse sine of x, otherwise called arc sine. And since it's a one-to-one -one function, if we apply the inverse function, sine, to both sides, the one-to-one -one property means that the right-hand side will evaluate to x, and the left-hand side is just sine of y. OK, so that's going to be critical for us. Before moving on, make sure that you can easily write down the definition of a function, that you know the statement of the vertical line test and how that's testing for functionality. Make sure to go back and review how the definition of a function can be slightly altered to produce the definition of a one-to-one -one function, and how the horizontal line test is testing whether the graph of a function is a one-to-one -one function. And then apply that into arguing why we restrict the graph of sine to produce the graph of inverse sine. Beautiful. And to prepare for your assignment of verifying everything that we do looking at arc sine, make sure that you're familiar with arc cosine as well as arc tangent. In particular, come up with their sketches of their graphs so that you know the domain and range of each of these. Good. All right, so now we're going to do the precise arguments to come up with a derivative of this inverse trig function. And then knowing a derivative of this inverse trig function will allow us to restate that in an integral form. Now, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we know how to differentiate tangent. Excuse me. Know how to, we know how to differentiate sine. So we're going to apply sine on both sides. We'll come up with sine of y on the right-hand side. Sine of this right-hand side would leave leave us with x over a, multiply both sides by a, and come up with the expression a sine of y equals x. 
Okay, so we're interested in a derivative of inverse sine. Here we have inverse sine expressed out as a function of x, but we're going to differentiate this expression, and we're going to differentiate this expression with respect to x. Go ahead and write that down. On the right-hand side, we have a very simple evaluation. That'll turn out to just be 1. And then on the left-hand side, remember that a is a constant. By assumption, it's taken to be positive. So that just pulls through. Then since we're differentiating with respect to x, we notice that we have sine of y. But noting that y is expressed out as a function of x, we're going to use the chain rule. So we'll come up with the derivative of the outside function, cosine of y, times the derivative of the inside function, dy dx. So write that out. a pops through. Derivative of sine goes to cosine, evaluated at the inside function. By the chain rule, multiply with the derivative of the inside function. All right. Easy enough. And noting that we want to come up with a derivative of arc sine, which is expressed as y, well, that's exactly dy dx. So if we solve for dy dx, now we have this curious fact that we're looking for the derivative of arc sine as a function of x. But we're getting an expression on the right-hand side, which tells us that we have to use cosine of the arc sine of x over a. Well, this derivative of arc sine, we would like to express it out as a function of the independent variable x, not as a function of arc sine. Okay, so we're going to address that, and we're going to use an elementary identity. This is essentially the Pythagorean theorem, but stated in terms of trig functions. And we're interested in expressing out cosine of y. So let's solve this for cosine of y. Begin by moving the sine squared term to the other side to produce cosine of y. Let's remove the power two, taking a radical. Note that on the right hand side we're not writing down plus minus. We've made a choice. We've chosen the positive. And in an assignment, you're going to be asked why we're justified in doing that. And it has to do with the fact that y is being set equal to arc sine. OK. Well, if you look at your notes, you know that we're interested in swapping out for a cosine of y. So let's multiply both sides by a. And it's going to be convenient for us to push the a underneath the radical. And to push underneath, that a to the first needs to be raised to the power 2, since a to the power 2 raised to the 1 half re reproduces a. And again, remember that a is a assumed to be positive. Quick note, a squared times sine squared of y is the same thing as a times sine of y, quantity squared. All right, we're ready to go back and plug this in. Let's come back to where we were. dy dx equals 1 over a cosine of y. We want to swap that out with this radical expression obtained from the Pythagorean identity. But remember that our objective was to produce dy dx as a function of x, and it doesn't seem that we've made progress in that direction.
but noting at the top that a sine of y is exactly x, voila, we have a nice algebraic expression for the derivative of arcsine of x divided by a. Pretty fantastic. Okay, so let's collect that together. So if we have a function y set equal to arc sine of x over a, we know how its derivative will look. And then rephrasing that in terms of integrals, we know that the integral of this radical function is arc sine of x over a plus any constant. Very good. We'll do an example next. And before that, remember that you're going to want to apply the arguments that we just did to produce similar looking functions, excuse me, similar looking formulas for arc cosine and arc tangent. All right, let's look at some examples. So here, the value b is taken to be b between 0 and 1. And b is used as the upper bound. And then looking at the integrand, it matches up with our formula, provided that we set a equal to positive 1. So that simplifies the antiderivative as just arc sine of x, and that's what we get. We have a quick evaluation. Plug in the bounds, and then arc sine of 0. Well, sine of 0 produces 0, so arc sine of 0 is 0. B, we don't have a precise value. It's anything between 0 and 1. Thus, our answer is arc sine of b. Done. Brilliant. Okay. So here's uh, true-false, two true-false statements. If we have a as a non-zero value, the domain of arc sine of x over a is negative 1 to 1. True or false. Second statement, if y is arc sine of x over a, then cosine of y is non-negative. Is that statement true or false? And remember that non-negative is anything which is not negative. So that allows for zero and positive values. Excellent. Another assignment. The integral I1 is a definite integral. So this is recalling, asking you to recall output values of arcsine. And then in integral I2, you'll want to do some algebraic prep work to deal with this coefficient 4 in order to match the form nicely. Essentially, you want to factor off that 4. Very good. So we've looked at the derivative of inverse sine. Let's make some comments about the derivative of arc cosine and the derivative of arc tangent. So for arc cosine, let's recall this nice behavior that the derivative of sine produces cosine, and then if you differentiate that, you get a negative sine. 
So the idea here is that uh, in the case of sine, there's no negative produced, but in the case of cosine, there is a negative produced. And something similar carries over in the case of the inverse trig. So arc sine of x over a is an antiderivative for this expression. And if we place a minus on it, then we can come up with antiderivative inverse cosine. OK, that's convenient as a formula. You'll want to verify that that is indeed the truth. OK. Next, we're looking at the formula for inverse tangent as an antiderivative. And you'll want to note that on the right-hand side, there is a coefficient 1 over a, which is lacking from the formulas involving inverse cosine and inverse sine. And then the integrand here is 1 over a squared plus x squared, or in other words, letting y equal this expression of inverse tangent, its derivative is 1 over a squared plus x squared. Again, you'll want to follow the work that we did for inverse sine and verify this derivative. Nice. Let's take as fact this formula and do an example. So we're going to use the inverse trig formula. And we'll make use of that since in the denominator, e to the 2x is the same thing as e to the x quantity squared. So that if we let u equal e to the x, this denominator will become 4 plus u squared. So that will mean that a will be set equal to 2. And instead of dummy variable x, we'll have dummy variable u. And then looking at u equal e to the x, the differential du is e to the x dx, which exactly matches this numerator, e to the x dx. As we're looking at a definite integral, when we swap out bounds, we're going to take lower bound for x as ln of 2, plug that into the identity u equals e to the x, to come up with u having a lower bound of e to the ln of 2, but that is just 2. Likewise, the upper bound for u is going to be e to the ln of 2 rad 3, or just 2 rad 3. Let's make that substitution. Good. So new bounds on u, and a integrand, which exactly matches this formula. Nice. So plugging in with a equaling 2, we have 1 over 2 arctan of x, which is now u, over 2, and then evaluated at bounds. So plugging in, we get i is arctan of rad 3, 2 over 2 goes to 1, minus arctan of 1, all multiplied by 1 half. And then arctan of rad 3 is pi over 3, and arctan of 1 is pi over 4. 
Combining those two values, multiplying by half, gives us our answer of pi over 24. Fantastic. Here's one for you. Definite integral, cosine of arctan of t, composition in the top, all over 1 plus t squared, integral with respect to t. That's a nice one. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next one.